The Confederate States of America CSA or CS, commonly referred to as the Confederacy in the South, was an unrecognized country in North America that existed from 1861 to 1865. The Confederacy was originally formed by seven secessionist slave-holding states—South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas— in the lower south region of the United States, whose economy was heavily dependent upon agriculture, particularly cotton, and a plantation system that relied upon the labor of African American slaves, each state declared its secession from the United States, which became known as the Union during the ensuing Civil War, following the November 1860 election of Republican candidate Abraham Lincoln to the U.S. presidency on a platform which opposed the expansion of slavery into the Western territories. Before Lincoln took office in March, a new Confederate government was established in February 1861, which was considered illegal by the government of the United States. States volunteered militia units and the new government hastened to form its own Confederate States Army from scratch practically overnight. After the American Civil War began in April, four slave states of the Upper South—Virginia, Arkansas, Tennessee, and North Carolina—also declared their secession and joined the Confederacy. The Confederacy later accepted Missouri and Kentucky as members, although neither officially declared secession nor were they ever largely controlled by Confederate forces. Confederate shadow governments attempted to control the two states but were later exiled from them. The government of the United States, the Union, rejected the claims of secession and considered the Confederacy illegally founded. The war began with the Confederate attack upon Fort Sumter on April 12, 1861, a Union fort in the harbor of Charleston, South Carolina. No foreign government officially recognized the Confederacy as an independent country, although Great Britain and France granted it belligerent status, which allowed Confederate agents to contract with private concerns for arms and other supplies. In early 1865, after four years of heavy fighting which led to 620,000 to 850,000 military deaths, all the Confederate forces surrendered and the Confederacy vanished. The war lacked a formal end, nearly all Confederate forces had been forced into surrender or deliberately disbanded by the end of 1865, by which point the dwindling manpower and resources of the Confederacy were facing overwhelming odds. By 1865, Jefferson Davis lamented that the Confederacy had disappeared. Topic: <laughs> Span of control. On February 22, 1862, the Confederate Constitution of seven state signatories, Mississippi, South Carolina, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas, replaced the Provisional Constitution of February 8, 1861, with one stating in its preamble a desire for a permanent federal government. Four additional slave-holding states, Virginia, Arkansas, Tennessee, and North Carolina, declared their secession and joined the Confederacy following a call by U.S. President Abraham Lincoln for troops from each state to recapture Sumter and other seized federal properties in the South. Missouri and Kentucky were represented by partisan factions adopting the forms of state governments without control of substantial territory or population in either case. The antebellum state governments in both maintained their representation in the Union. Also fighting for the Confederacy were two of the five civilized tribes, the Choctaw and the Chickasaw, in Indian Territory and a new, but uncontrolled, Confederate Territory of Arizona. Efforts by certain factions in Maryland to secede were halted by federal imposition of martial law. Delaware, though of divided loyalty, did not attempt it. A Unionist government was formed in opposition to the secessionist state government in Richmond and administered the western parts of Virginia that had been occupied by federal troops. The restored government later recognized the new state of West Virginia, which was admitted to the Union during the war on June 20, 1863, and relocated to Alexandria for the rest of the war. Confederate control over its claimed territory and population in congressional districts steadily shrank from 73% to 34% during the course of the American Civil War due to the Union's successful overland campaigns, its control of the inland waterways into the south, and its blockade of the southern coast. With the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1, 1863, the Union made abolition of slavery a war goal in addition to reunion. As Union forces moved southward, large numbers of plantation slaves were freed. Many joined the Union lines, enrolling in service as soldiers, teamsters and laborers. The most notable advance was Sherman's March to the Sea in late 1864. 
Much of the Confederacy's infrastructure was destroyed, including telegraphs, railroads and bridges. Plantations in the path of Sherman's forces were severely damaged. Internal movement became increasingly difficult for Southerners, weakening the economy and limiting army mobility. These losses created an insurmountable disadvantage in men, materiel, and finance. Public support for Confederate President Jefferson Davis's administration eroded over time due to repeated military reverses, economic hardships, and allegations of autocratic government. After four years of campaigning, Richmond was captured by Union forces in April 1865. A few days later General Robert E. Lee surrendered to Union General Ulysses S. Grant, effectively signaling the collapse of the Confederacy. President Davis was captured on May 10, 1865, and jailed in preparation for a treason trial that was ultimately never held. History The initial Confederacy was established in the Montgomery Convention in February 1861 by seven states South Carolina, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, adding Texas in March before Lincoln's inauguration, expanded in May–July 1861 with Virginia, Arkansas, Tennessee, North Carolina, and was disintegrated in April–May 1865. It was formed by delegations from seven slave states of the Lower South that had proclaimed their secession from the Union. After the fighting began in April, four additional slave states seceded and were admitted. Later, two slave states Missouri and, Kentucky and two territories were given seats in the Confederate Congress. Southern California, although having some pro-Confederate sentiment, was never organized as a territory. Many Southern whites had considered themselves more Southern than American and were prepared to fight for their state and their region to be independent of the larger nation. That regionalism became a Southern nationalism, or the cause. For the duration of its existence, the Confederacy underwent trial by war. The Southern cause transcended the ideology of states' rights, tariff policy, or internal improvements. This cause supported, or descended from, cultural and financial dependence on the South's slavery-based economy. The convergence of race and slavery, politics, and economics raised almost all South-related policy questions to the status of moral questions over way of life, commingly love of things Southern and hatred of things Yankee the North. Not only did national political parties split, but national churches and interstate families as well divided along sectional lines as the war approached. According to historian John M. Kosky, The statesmen who led the secession movement were unashamed to explicitly cite the defense of slavery as their prime motive. Acknowledging the centrality of slavery to the Confederacy is essential for understanding the Confederate. Southern Democrats had chosen John Breckinridge as their candidate during the U.S. presidential election of 1860, but in no southern state other than South Carolina, where the legislature chose the electors was support for him unanimous. All of the other states recorded at least some popular votes for one or more of the other three candidates Abraham Lincoln, Stephen A. Douglas and John Bell. Support for these candidates, collectively, ranged from significant to an outright majority, with extremes running from 25% in Texas to 81% in Missouri. There were minority views everywhere, especially in the upland and plateau areas of the South, with western Virginia and eastern Tennessee of particular concentration. Following South Carolina's unanimous 1860 secession vote, no other southern states considered the question until 1861, and when they did none had a unanimous vote. All had residents who cast significant numbers of Unionist votes in either the legislature, conventions, popular referendums, or in all three. Voting to remain in the Union did not necessarily mean that individuals were Northern sympathizers. Once hostilities began, many of these who voted to remain in the Union, particularly in the Deep South, accepted the majority decision, and supported the Confederacy. The American Civil War became an American tragedy, what some scholars termed the Brothers' War, pitting brother against brother, father against son, kin against kin of every degree. A revolution in disunion According to historian Avery O. Craven in 1950, the Confederate States of America was created by secessionists in southern slave states who believed that the federal government was making them second-class citizens and refused to honor their belief that slavery was beneficial to the Negro. 
They judged the agent of change to be abolitionists and anti-slavery elements in the Republican Party, whom they believed used repeated insult and injury to subject them to intolerable humiliation and degradation. The Black Republicans, as the Southerners called them, and their allies soon dominated the U.S. House, Senate, and presidency. On the U.S. Supreme Court, Chief Justice Roger B. Taney, a presumed supporter of slavery, was 83 years old and ailing. During the campaign for president in 1860, some secessionists threatened disunion should Lincoln, who opposed the expansion of slavery into the territories, be elected, most notably William L. Yancey. Yancey toured the North calling for secession as Stephen A. Douglas toured the South calling for union in the event of Lincoln's election. To the secessionists the Republican intent was clear, to contain slavery within its present bounds, and, eventually, to eliminate it entirely. A Lincoln victory presented them with a momentous choice as they saw it, even before his inauguration. The Union without slavery, or slavery without the Union. Topic. Causes of secession The immediate catalyst for secession was the victory of the Republican Party and the election of Abraham Lincoln as president in the 1860 elections. American Civil War historian James M. McPherson suggested that, for the Southerners, the most ominous feature of the Republican victories in the congressional and presidential elections of 1860 was the magnitude of those victories. Republicans captured over 60% of the Northern vote, and won three-fourths of its congressional delegations. The Southern press said that such Republicans represented the anti-slavery portion of the North, a party founded on the single sentiment of hatred of African slavery, and now the controlling power in national affairs. The Black Republican Party could overwhelm conservative Yankees. The New Orleans Delta said of the Republicans, it is in fact, essentially, a revolutionary party. To overthrow slavery, by 1860, sectional disagreements between North and South relate primarily to the maintenance or expansion of slavery in the United States. Historian Drew Gilpin Faust observed that, "...leaders of the secession movement across the South cited slavery as the most compelling reason for Southern independence." Although most white Southerners did not own slaves, the majority supported the institution of slavery and benefited in indirect ways from the slave society. For struggling yeomen and subsistence farmers, the slave society provided a large class of people ranked lower in the social scale than they. Secondary differences related to issues of free speech, runaway slaves, expansion into Cuba, and states' rights. Historian Emery Thomas assessed the Confederacy's self-image by studying the correspondence sent by the Confederate government in 1861-62 to foreign governments. He found that Confederate diplomacy projected multiple contradictory self-images. The Southern nation was by turns a guileless people attacked by a voracious neighbor, an established nation in some temporary difficulty, a collection of bucolic aristocrats making a romantic stand against the banalities of industrial democracy, a cabal of commercial farmers seeking to make a pawn of King Cotton, an apotheosis of 19th-century nationalism and revolutionary liberalism, or the ultimate statement of social and economic reaction. In what later became known as the Cornerstone Speech, C.S. Vice President Alexander H. Stevens declared that the cornerstone of the new government rest ed upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery, subordination to the superior race, is his natural and normal condition. This, our new government, is the first, in the history of the world, based upon this great physical, philosophical, and moral truth. After the war Stevens made efforts to qualify his remarks, claiming they were extemporaneous, metaphorical, and intended to refer to public sentiment rather than the principles of the new government on this subject. Four of the seceding states, the Deep South states of South Carolina, Mississippi, Georgia, and Texas, issued formal declarations of causes, each of which identified the threat to slaveholders' rights as the cause of, or a major cause of, secession. Georgia also claimed a general federal policy of favoring northern over southern economic interests. Texas mentioned slavery 21 times, but also listed the failure of the federal government to live up to its obligations, in the original annexation agreement, to protect settlers along the exposed western frontier. Texas resolutions further stated that governments of the states and the nation were established exclusively by the white race, for themselves and their posterity. 
They also stated that although equal civil and political rights applied to all white men, they did not apply to those of the African race, further opining that the end of racial enslavement would bring inevitable calamities upon both races and desolation upon the fifteen slave-holding states." Alabama did not provide a separate declaration of causes. Instead the Alabama Ordinance stated, "...the election of Abraham Lincoln by a sectional party, avowedly hostile to the domestic institutions and to the peace and security of the people of the state of Alabama, preceded by many and dangerous infractions of the Constitution of the United States by many of the states and people of the northern section, is a political wrong of so insulting and menacing a character as to justify the people of the state of Alabama in the adoption of prompt and decided measures for their future peace and security. The ordinance invited, "...the slaveholding states of the South, who may approve such purpose, in order to frame a provisional as well as a permanent government upon the principles of the Constitution of the United States," to participate in a February 4, 1861 convention in Montgomery, Alabama. The secession ordinances of the remaining two states, Florida and Louisiana, simply declared their severing of ties with the Federal Union, without stating any causes. Afterward, the Florida Secession Convention formed a committee to draft a declaration of causes, but the committee was discharged before completion of the task. Only an undated, untitled draft remains. Four of the Upper South states initially rejected secession until after the clash at feet. Sumter, Virginia, Arkansas, Tennessee, and North Carolina. Virginia's ordinance stated a kinship with the slave-holding states of the Lower South, but did not name the institution itself as a primary reason for its course. Arkansas's secession ordinance primarily revolved around strong objection to the use of military force to maintain the Union as its motivating factor. Prior to the outbreak of war, the Arkansas Convention had on March 20 given as their first resolution. The people of the northern states have organized a political party, purely sectional in its character, the central and controlling idea of which is hostility to the institution of African slavery, as it exists in the southern states, and that party has elected a president pledged to administer the government upon principles inconsistent with the rights and subversive of the interests of the southern states. North Carolina and Tennessee limited their ordinances to simply withdrawing, although Tennessee went so far as to make clear they wished to make no comment at all on the "...abstract doctrine of secession." In a message to the Confederate Congress on April 29, 1861 Jefferson Davis cited both the tariff and slavery for the South's secession. Topic. Secessionists and conventions The Fire Eaters, calling for immediate secession, were opposed by two factions. Cooperationists in the Deep South would delay secession until several states went together, maybe in a Southern convention. Under the influence of men such as Texas Governor Sam Houston, delay would have had the effect of sustaining the Union. Unionists, especially in the Border South, often former Whigs, appealed to sentimental attachment to the United States. Southern Unionists' favorite presidential candidate was John Bell of Tennessee, sometimes running under an «opposition party» banner. Many secessionists were active politically. Governor William Henry Gist of South Carolina corresponded secretly with other Deep South governors, and most Southern governors exchanged clandestine commissioners. Charleston Secessionist, 1860 Association, published over 200,000 pamphlets to persuade the youth of the South. The most influential were the doom of slavery and the South alone should govern the South, both by John Townsend of South Carolina and James D. B. DuBose. The interest of slavery of the Southern non-slaveholder. Developments in South Carolina started a chain of events. The foreman of a jury refused the legitimacy of federal courts, so federal judge Andrew McGrath ruled that U.S. judicial authority in South Carolina was vacated. A mass meeting in Charleston celebrating the Charleston and Savannah Railroad and State Cooperation led to the South Carolina legislature to call for a secession convention. U.S. Senator James Chestnut Jr. resigned, as did Senator James Henry Hammond. Elections for secessionist conventions were heated to an almost raving pitch, no one dared dissent, said Freeling. Even once respected voices, including the Chief Justice of South Carolina, John Belton O'Neill, lost election to the secession convention on a cooperationist ticket. 
Across the South mobs expelled Yankees and in Texas executed German Americans suspected of loyalty to the United States. Generally, seceding conventions which followed did not call for a referendum to ratify, although Texas, Arkansas, and Tennessee did, as well as Virginia's second convention. Kentucky declared neutrality, while Missouri had its own civil war until the Unionists took power and drove the Confederate legislators out of the state. Topic. Attempts to thwart secession In the antebellum months, the Corwin Amendment was an unsuccessful attempt by the Congress to bring back the seceding states to the Union and to prevent the border slave states to remain. It was a proposed amendment to the United States Constitution by Ohio Congressman Thomas Corwin that would shield domestic institutions of the states which in 1861 included slavery from the constitutional amendment process and from abolition or interference by Congress. It was passed by the 36th Congress on March 2, 1861. The House approved it by a vote of 133 to 65 and the United States Senate adopted it with no changes on a vote of 24 to 12. It was then submitted to the state legislatures for ratification. In his inaugural address Lincoln endorsed the proposed amendment. The text was as follows. No amendment shall be made to the Constitution which will authorize or give to Congress the power to abolish or interfere, within any state, with the domestic institutions thereof, including that of persons held to labor or service by the laws of said state. Had it been ratified by the required number of states prior to 1865, it would have made institutionalized slavery immune to the constitutional amendment procedures and to interference by Congress. Topic. Inauguration and response The first secession state conventions from the Deep South sent representatives to meet at the Montgomery Convention in Montgomery, Alabama, on February 4, 1861. There the fundamental documents of government were promulgated, a provisional government was established, and a representative Congress met for the Confederate States of America. The new provisional Confederate President Jefferson Davis issued a call for 100,000 men from the various states' militias to defend the newly formed Confederacy. All federal property was seized, along with gold bullion and coining dies at the U.S. mints in Charlotte, North Carolina, Dahlonega, Georgia, and New Orleans. The Confederate capital was moved from Montgomery to Richmond, Virginia, in May 1861. On February 22, 1862, Davis was inaugurated as president with a term of six years. The newly inaugurated Confederate administration pursued a policy of national territorial integrity, continuing earlier state efforts in 1860 and early 1861 to remove U.S. government presence from within their boundaries. These efforts included taking possession of U.S. courts, custom houses, post offices, and most notably, arsenals and forts. But after the Confederate attack and capture of Fort Sumter in April 1861, Lincoln called up 75,000 of the state's militia to muster under his command. The stated purpose was to reoccupy U.S. properties throughout the South, as the U.S. Congress had not authorized their abandonment. The resistance at Fort Sumter signaled his change of policy from that of the Buchanan administration. Lincoln's response ignited a firestorm of emotion. The people of both North and South demanded war, and young men rushed to their colors in the hundreds of thousands. Four more states Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas refused Lincoln's call for troops and declared secession, while Kentucky maintained an uneasy neutrality. Topic. Secession Secessionists argued that the United States Constitution was a contract among sovereign states that could be abandoned at any time without consultation and that each state had a right to secede. After intense debates and statewide votes, seven Deep South Cotton states passed secession ordinances by February 1861 before Abraham Lincoln took office as president, while secession efforts failed in the other eight slave states. Delegates from those seven formed the CSA in February 1861, selecting Jefferson Davis as the provisional president. Unionist talk of reunion failed and Davis began raising a 100,000-man army. Topic. States Initially, some secessionists may have hoped for a peaceful departure. Moderates in the Confederate Constitutional Convention included a provision against importation of slaves from Africa to appeal to the Upper South. 
Non-slave states might join, but the radicals secured a two-thirds hurdle for them. Seven states declared their secession from the United States before Lincoln took office on March 4, 1861. After the Confederate attack on Fort Sumter April 12, 1861, and Lincoln's subsequent call for troops on April 15, four more states declared their secession. Kentucky declared neutrality but after Confederate troops moved in, the state government asked for Union troops to drive them out. The splinter Confederate state government relocated to accompany Western Confederate armies and never controlled the state population. By the end of the war, 90,000 Kentuckians had fought on the side of the Union, compared to 35,000 for the Confederate states. In Missouri, a constitutional convention was approved and delegates elected by voters. The convention rejected secession 89 to 1 on March 19, 1861. The governor maneuvered to take control of the St. Louis arsenal and restrict federal movements. This led to confrontation, and in June, federal forces drove him and the General Assembly from Jefferson City. The Executive Committee of the Constitutional Convention called the members together in July. The convention declared the state offices vacant, and appointed a Unionist interim state government. The exiled governor called a rump session of the former General Assembly together in Neosho and, on October 31, 1861, passed an ordinance of secession. It is still a matter of debate as to whether a quorum existed for this vote. The Confederate state government was unable to control very much Missouri territory. It had its capital first at Neosho, then at Cassville, before being driven out of the state. For the remainder of the war, it operated as a government in exile at Marshall, Texas. Neither Kentucky nor Missouri was declared in rebellion in Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. The Confederacy recognized the pro-Confederate claimants in both Kentucky December 10, 1861 and Missouri November 28, 1861 and laid claim to those states, granting them congressional representation and adding two stars to the Confederate flag. Voting for the representatives was mostly done by Confederate soldiers from Kentucky and Missouri. The order of secession resolutions and dates are 1. South Carolina December 20, 1860 2. Mississippi January 9, 1861 3. Florida January 10 4. Alabama January 11 5. Georgia January 19 6. Louisiana January 26 7. Texas February 1st referendum February 23rd bombardment of Fort Sumter April 12th and President Lincoln's call up April 15th 8 Virginia April 17th referendum May 23rd 1861 9 Arkansas May 6th 10 Tennessee May 7th referendum June 8th 11 North Carolina May 20th in Virginia the populous counties along the Ohio and Pennsylvania borders rejected the confederacy Unionists held a convention in Wheeling in June 1861, establishing a restored government with a rump legislature, but sentiment in the region remained deeply divided. In the 50 counties that would make up the state of West Virginia, voters from 24 counties had voted for disunion in Virginia's May 23 referendum on the Ordinance of Secession. In the 1860 presidential election, Constitutional Democrat Breckinridge had outpolled Constitutional Unionist. Bell in the 50 counties by 1,900 votes, 44% to 42%. Regardless of scholarly disputes over election procedures and results county by county, altogether they simultaneously supplied over 20,000 soldiers to each side of the conflict. Representatives for most of the counties were seated in both state legislatures at Wheeling and at Richmond for the duration of the war. Attempts to secede from the Confederacy by some counties in East Tennessee were checked by martial law. Although slave-holding Delaware and Maryland did not secede, citizens from those states exhibited divided loyalties. Regiments of Marylanders fought in Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. But overall, 24,000 men from Maryland joined the Confederate armed forces, compared to 63,000 who joined Union forces. Delaware never produced a full regiment for the Confederacy, but neither did it emancipate slaves as did Missouri and West Virginia. District of Columbia citizens made no attempts to secede and through the war years, referendums sponsored by President Lincoln approved systems of compensated emancipation and slave confiscation from disloyal citizens. Territories 
Citizens at Mesilla and Tucson in the southern part of New Mexico Territory formed a secession convention, which voted to join the Confederacy on March 16, 1861, and appointed Louis Owings as the new territorial governor. They won the Battle of Mesilla and established a territorial government with Mesilla serving as its capital. The Confederacy proclaimed the Confederate Arizona Territory on February 14, 1862, north to the 34th parallel. Marcus H. McQuilly served in both Confederate Congresses as Arizona's delegate. In 1862 the Confederate New Mexico campaign to take the northern half of the U.S. territory failed and the Confederate territorial government in exile relocated to San Antonio, Texas. Confederate supporters in the Trans-Mississippi West also claimed portions of United States Indian Territory after the United States evacuated the federal forts and installations. Over half of the American Indian troops participating in the Civil War from the Indian Territory supported the Confederacy, troops and one general were enlisted from each tribe. On July 12, 1861, the Confederate government signed a treaty with both the Choctaw and Chickasaw Indian nations. After several battles Union armies took control of the territory, Indian territory was never formally ceded into the Confederacy by American Indian councils, but like Missouri and Kentucky, the five civilized nations received representation in the Confederate Congress and their citizens were integrated into regular Confederate Army units. After 1863 the tribal governments sent representatives to the Confederate Congress, Elias Cornelius Boudinot representing the Cherokee and Samuel Benton Callahan representing the Seminole and Creek people. The Cherokee Nation, aligning with the Confederacy, alleged northern violations of the Constitution, waging war against slavery commercial and political interests, abolishing slavery in the Indian Territory, and that the North intended to seize additional Indian lands. Topic. Capitals Montgomery, Alabama served as the capital of the Confederate States of America from February 4 until May 29, 1861, in the Alabama State Capitol. Six states created the Confederate States of America there on February 8, 1861. The Texas delegation was seated at the time, so it is counted in the original seven. States of the Confederacy, it had no roll call vote until after its referendum made secession operative. Two sessions of the Provisional Congress were held in Montgomery, adjourning May 21. The permanent constitution was adopted there on March 12, 1861. The permanent capital provided for in the Confederate Constitution called for a state session of a 10 mile square, 100 square mile district to the central government. Atlanta, which had not yet supplanted Milledgeville, Georgia as its state capital, put in a bid noting its central location and rail connections, as did Opelika, Alabama, noting its strategically interior situation, rail connections and nearby deposits of coal and iron. Richmond, Virginia was chosen for the interim capital at the Virginia State Capitol. The move was used by Vice President Stevens and others to encourage other border states to follow Virginia into the Confederacy. In the political moment it was a show of defiance and strength. The war for Southern independence was surely to be fought in Virginia, but it also had the largest Southern military-aged white population, with infrastructure, resources and supplies required to sustain a war. The Davis administration's policy was that, it must be held at all hazards. The naming of Richmond as the new capital took place on May 30, 1861, and the last two sessions of the Provisional Congress were held in the new capital. The permanent Confederate Congress and President were elected in the states and army camps on November 6, 1861. The first Congress met in four sessions in Richmond from February 18, 1862, to February 17, 1864. The second Congress met there in two sessions, from May 2, 1864, to March 18, 1865. As war dragged on, Richmond became crowded with training and transfers, logistics and hospitals. Prices rose dramatically despite government efforts at price regulation. A movement in Congress led by Henry S. Foote of Tennessee argued for moving the capital from Richmond. At the approach of federal armies in mid-1862, the government's archives were readied for removal. As the Wilderness Campaign progressed, Congress authorized Davis to remove the Executive Department and call Congress to session elsewhere in 1864 and again in 1865. Shortly before the end of the war, the Confederate government evacuated Richmond, planning to relocate farther south. Little came of these plans before Lee's surrender at Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia on April 9, 1865. 
Davis and most of his cabinet fled to Danville, Virginia, which served as their headquarters for about a week. Topic: <laughs> Unionism. Unionism was widespread in the Confederacy, especially in the mountain regions of Appalachia and the Ozarks. Unionists, led by Parson Brownlow and Senator Andrew Johnson, took control of eastern Tennessee in 1863. Unionists also attempted control over western Virginia but never effectively held more than half the counties that formed the new state of West Virginia. Union forces captured parts of coastal North Carolina, and at first were welcomed by local unionists. That changed as the occupiers became perceived as oppressive, callous, radical and favorable to the freedmen. Occupiers engaged in pillaging, freeing of slaves, and eviction of those refusing to take or reneging on the loyalty oaths. As ex Unionists began to support the Confederate cause, support for the Confederacy was perhaps weakest in Texas. Claude Elliott estimates that only a third of the population actively supported the Confederacy. Many Unionists supported the Confederacy after the war began, but many others clung to their Unionism throughout the war, especially in the northern counties, the German districts, and the Mexican areas. According to Ernest Wallace, "...this account of a dissatisfied Unionist minority, although historically essential, must be kept in its proper perspective, for throughout the war the overwhelming majority of the people zealously supported the Confederacy." Randolph B. Campbell states, "...in spite of terrible losses and hardships, most Texans continued throughout the war to support the Confederacy as they had supported secession." Dale Baum in his analysis of Texas politics in the era counters, "...this idea of a Confederate Texas united politically against Northern adversaries was shaped more by nostalgic fantasies than by wartime realities." He characterizes Texas Civil War history as, "...a morose story of intragovernmental rivalries coupled with wide-ranging disaffection that prevented effective implementation of state wartime policies." In Texas local officials harassed Unionists and engaged in large-scale massacres against Unionists and Germans. In Cook County 150 suspected Unionists were arrested, 25 were lynched without trial and 40 more were hanged after a summary trial. Draft resistance was widespread especially among Texans of German or Mexican descent, many of the latter went to Mexico. Potential draftees went into hiding, Confederate officials hunted them down, and many were shot. Civil liberties were of small concern in North and South. Lincoln and Davis both took a hard line against dissent. Neely explores how the Confederacy became a virtual police state with guards and patrols all about, and a domestic passport system whereby everyone needed official permission each time they wanted to travel. Over 4,000 suspected Unionists were imprisoned without trial. Topic. Diplomacy Topic. United States, a foreign power During the four years of its existence under trial by war, the Confederate States of America asserted its independence and appointed dozens of diplomatic agents abroad. None were ever officially recognized by a foreign government. The United States government regarded the southern states in rebellion and so refused any formal recognition of their status. Even before Fort Sumter, U.S. Secretary of State William H. Seward issued formal instructions to the American minister to Britain, Charles Francis Adams, Make no expressions of harshness or disrespect, or even impatience concerning the seceding states, their agents, or their people. Those states must always continue to be equal and honored members of this federal union, their citizens still are and always must be our kindred and countrymen. Seward instructed Adams that if the British government seemed inclined to recognize the Confederacy, or even waver in that regard, it was to receive a sharp warning, with a strong hint of war. If Britain is tolerating the application of the so-called seceding states, or wavering about it, they cannot remain friends with the United States. If they determine to recognize the Confederacy, Britain may at the same time prepare to enter into alliance with the enemies of this republic. The United States government never declared war on those kindred and countrymen in the Confederacy, but conducted its military efforts beginning with a presidential proclamation issued April 15, 1861. It called for troops to recapture forts and suppress what Lincoln later called an insurrection and rebellion. 
Mid-war parleys between the two sides occurred without formal political recognition, though the laws of war predominantly governed military relationships on both sides of uniformed conflict. On the part of the Confederacy, immediately following Fort Sumter, the Confederate Congress proclaimed that war exists between the Confederate States and the government of the United States, and the states and territories thereof. A state of war was not to formally exist between the Confederacy and those states and territories in the United States allowing slavery, although Confederate Rangers were compensated for destruction they could effect there throughout the war. Concerning the international status and nationhood of the Confederate States of America, in 1869 the United States Supreme Court in Texas v. White, 74 U.S. 7 Wall, 700 1869 ruled Texas's declaration of secession was legally null and void. Jefferson Davis, former president of the Confederacy, and Alexander H. Stevens, its former vice president, both wrote post-war arguments in favor of secession's legality and the international legitimacy of the government of the Confederate States of America, most notably Davis's The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> International Diplomacy. Once war with the United States began, the Confederacy pinned its hopes for survival on military intervention by Great Britain and France. The Confederates who had believed that, "...cotton is king," that is, that Britain had to support the Confederacy to obtain cotton, proved mistaken. The British had stocks to last over a year and had been developing alternative sources of cotton, most notably India and Egypt. They were not about to go to war with the U.S. to acquire more cotton at the risk of losing the large quantities of food imported from the North. The Confederate government repeatedly sent delegations to Europe, but historians give them low marks for their poor diplomacy. James M. Mason went to London and John Slidell traveled to Paris. They were unofficially interviewed, but neither secured official recognition for the Confederacy. In late 1861 the seizure of two senior Confederate diplomats aboard a British ship by the U.S. Navy outraged Britain and led to a war scare in the Trent Affair. Queen Victoria insisted on giving the Americans an exit route and Lincoln took it, releasing the two diplomats. Tensions cooled, and the Confederacy gained no advantage. In recent years most historians argue that the risk of actual war over the Trent Affair was small, because it would have hurt both sides. Throughout the early years of the war, British Foreign Secretary Lord John Russell, Emperor Napoleon III of France, and, to a lesser extent, British Prime Minister Lord Palmerston, showed interest in recognition of the Confederacy or at least mediation of the war. William Ewart Gladstone, the British Chancellor of the Exchequer Finance Minister, in office 1859-1866, whose family wealth was based on slavery, was the key minister calling for intervention to help the Confederacy achieve independence. He failed to convince Prime Minister Palmerston. By September 1862 the Union victory at the Battle of Antietam, Lincoln's preliminary emancipation proclamation and abolitionist opposition in Britain put an end to these possibilities. The cost to Britain of a war with the U.S. would have been high, the immediate loss of American grain shipments, the end of British exports to the U.S., and the seizure of billions of pounds invested in American securities. War would have meant higher taxes in Britain, another invasion of Canada, and full-scale worldwide attacks on the British merchant fleet. Outright recognition would have meant certain war with the United States. In mid-1862 fears of race war as had transpired in the Haitian Revolution of 1791-1804 led to the British considering intervention for humanitarian reasons. Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation did not lead to interracial violence, let alone a bloodbath, but it did give the Friends of the Union strong talking points in the arguments that raged across Britain. John Slidell, the Confederate States emissary to France, did succeed in negotiating a loan of $15 million from Erlanger and other French capitalists. The money went to buy ironclad warships, as well as military supplies that came in with blockade runners. The British government did allow the construction of blockade runners in Britain, they were owned and operated by British financiers and sailors, a few were owned and operated by the Confederacy. The British investors' goal was to get highly profitable cotton. Several European nations maintained diplomats in place who had been appointed to the US, but no country appointed any diplomat to the Confederacy. Those nations recognised the Union and Confederate sides as belligerents. In 1863 the Confederacy expelled European diplomatic missions for advising their resident subjects to refuse to serve in the Confederate Army. Both Confederate and Union agents were allowed to work openly in British territories. 
Some state governments in northern Mexico negotiated local agreements to cover trade on the Texas border. Pope Pius IX wrote a letter to Jefferson Davis in which he addressed Davis as the "...honorable president of the Confederate States of America." The Confederacy appointed Ambrose Dudley Mann as special agent to the Holy See on September 24, 1863. But the Holy See never released a formal statement supporting or recognizing the Confederacy. In November 1863, Mann met Pope Pius IX in person and received a letter supposedly addressed, "...to the illustrious and honorable Jefferson Davis, President of the Confederate States of America." Mann had mistranslated the address. In his report to Richmond, Mann claimed a great diplomatic achievement for himself, asserting the letter was, "...a positive recognition of our government." The letter was indeed used in propaganda, but Confederate Secretary of State Judah P. Benjamin told Mann it was, "...a mere inferential recognition, unconnected with political action or the regular establishment of diplomatic relations," and thus did not assign it the weight of formal recognition. Nevertheless, the Confederacy was seen internationally as a serious attempt at nationhood, and European governments sent military observers, both official and unofficial, to assess whether there had been a de facto establishment of independence. These observers included Arthur Leon Fremantle of the British Coldstream Guards, Fitzgerald Ross of the Austrian Hussars and Justus Scheibert of the Prussian Army. European travellers visited and wrote accounts for publication. Importantly in 1862, the Frenchman Charles Girard's seven months in the rebel states during the North American War testified, This government is no longer a trial government but really a normal government, the expression of popular will." Fremantle went on to write in his book Three Months in the Southern States that he had not attempted to conceal any of the peculiarities or defects of the Southern people. Many persons will doubtless highly disapprove of some of their customs and habits in the wilder portion of the country, but I think no generous man, whatever may be his political opinions, can do otherwise than admire the courage, energy, and patriotism of the whole population, and the skill of its leaders, in this struggle against great odds. And I am also of opinion that many will agree with me in thinking that a people in which all ranks and both sexes display a unanimity and a heroism which can never have been surpassed in the history of the world, is destined, sooner or later, to become a great and independent nation. French Emperor Napoleon III assured Confederate diplomat John Slidell that he would make direct proposition to Britain for joint recognition. The Emperor made the same assurance to British members of Parliament John A. Roebuck and John A. Lindsay. Roebuck in turn publicly prepared a bill to submit to Parliament June 30 supporting joint Anglo-French recognition of the Confederacy. Southerners had a right to be optimistic, or at least hopeful, that their revolution would prevail, or at least endure. Following the dual reverses at Vicksburg and Gettysburg in July 1863, the Confederates suffered a severe loss of confidence in themselves and withdrew into an interior defensive position. There would be no help from the Europeans. By December 1864, Davis considered sacrificing slavery in order to enlist recognition and aid from Paris and London. He secretly sent Duncan F. Kenner to Europe with a message that the war was fought solely for the vindication of our rights to self government and independence, and that no sacrifice is too great, save that of honor. The message stated that if the French or British governments made their recognition conditional on anything at all, the Confederacy would consent to such terms. Davis's message could not explicitly acknowledge that slavery was on the bargaining table due to still strong domestic support for slavery among the wealthy and politically influential. European leaders all saw that the Confederacy was on the verge of total defeat. Topic: <laughs> Confederacy at war. Topic. Motivations of soldiers The great majority of young white men voluntarily joined Confederate national or state military units. Perman 2010 says historians are of two minds on why millions of men seemed so eager to fight, suffer and die over four years. Some historians emphasize that Civil War soldiers were driven by political ideology, holding firm beliefs about the importance of liberty, union, or state rights, or about the need to protect or to destroy slavery. Others point to less overtly political reasons to fight, such as the defense of one's home and family, or the honor and brotherhood to be preserved when fighting alongside other men. 
Most historians agree that, no matter what he thought about when he went into the war, the experience of combat affected him profoundly and sometimes affected his reasons for continuing to fight. Topic. Military strategy Civil War historian E. Merton Coulter noted that for those who would secure its independence, the Confederacy was unfortunate in its failure to work out a general strategy for the whole war. Aggressive strategy called for offensive force concentration. Defensive strategy sought dispersal to meet demands of locally minded governors. The controlling philosophy evolved into a combination. Dispersal with a defensive concentration around Richmond. The Davis administration considered the war purely defensive, a simple demand that the people of the United States would cease to war upon us. Historian James M. McPherson is a critic of Lee's offensive strategy. Lee pursued a faulty military strategy that ensured Confederate defeat. As the Confederate government lost control of territory in campaign after campaign, it was said that the vast size of the Confederacy would make its conquest impossible. The enemy would be struck down by the same elements which so often debilitated or destroyed visitors and transplants in the South. Heat exhaustion, sunstroke, endemic diseases such as malaria and typhoid would match the destructive effectiveness of the Moscow winter on the invading armies of Napoleon. Early in the war both sides believed that one great battle would decide the conflict. The Confederate won a great victory at the First Battle of Bull Run, also known as First Manassas the name used by Confederate forces. It drove the Confederate people insane with joy. The public demanded a forward movement to capture Washington relocate the Confederate capital there, and admit Maryland to the Confederacy. A council of war by the victorious Confederate generals decided not to advance against larger numbers of fresh Federal troops in defensive positions. Davis did not countermand it. Following the Confederate incursion halted at the Battle of Antietam in October 1862, generals proposed concentrating forces from state commands to reinvade the North. Nothing came of it. Again in early 1863 at his incursion into Pennsylvania, Lee requested of Davis that Beauregard simultaneously attack Washington with troops taken from the Carolinas. But the troops there remained in place during the Gettysburg Campaign. The eleven states of the Confederacy were outnumbered by the North about four to one in white men of military age. It was overmatched far more in military equipment, industrial facilities, railroads for transport, and wagons supplying the front. Confederate military policy innovated to slow the invaders, but at heavy cost to the southern infrastructure. The Confederates burned bridges, laid land mines in the roads, and made harbors inlets and inland waterways unusable with sunken mines called torpedoes at the time. Coulter reports, Rangers in 20 to 50 man units were awarded 50% valuation for property destroyed behind Union lines, regardless of location or loyalty. As Federals occupied the South, objections by loyal Confederate concerning Ranger horse stealing and indiscriminate scorched earth tactics behind Union lines led to Congress abolishing the Ranger service two years later. The Confederacy relied on external sources for war materials. The first came from trade with the enemy. Vast amounts of war supplies came through Kentucky, and thereafter, Western armies were, to a very considerable extent, provisioned with illicit trade via federal agents and northern private traders. But that trade was interrupted in the first year of war by Admiral Porter's River gunboats as they gained dominance along navigable rivers north-south and east-west. Overseas blockade running then came to be of outstanding importance. On April 17, President Davis called on privateer raiders, the militia of the sea, to make war on U.S. seaborne commerce. Despite noteworthy effort, over the course of the war the Confederacy was found unable to match the Union in ships and seamanship, materials and marine construction. Perhaps the greatest obstacle to success in the 19th century warfare of mass armies was the Confederacy's lack of manpower, and sufficient numbers of disciplined, equipped troops in the field at the point of contact with the enemy. During the winter of 1862-63, Lee observed that none of his famous victories had resulted in the destruction of the opposing army. He lacked reserve troops to exploit an advantage on the battlefield as Napoleon had done. Lee explained, 
More than once have most promising opportunities been lost for want of men to take advantage of them, and victory itself had been made to put on the appearance of defeat, because our diminished and exhausted troops have been unable to renew a successful struggle against fresh numbers of the enemy. <laughs> Armed forces the military armed forces of the Confederacy comprised three branches, Army, Navy and Marine Corps. The Confederate military leadership included many veterans from the United States Army and United States Navy who had resigned their federal commissions and had won appointment to senior positions in the Confederate armed forces. Many had served in the Mexican-American War including Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis, but some such as Leonidas Polk who graduated from West Point but did not serve in the Army had little or no experience. The Confederate Officer Corps consisted of men from both slave-owning and non-slave-owning families. The Confederacy appointed junior and field grade officers by election from the enlisted ranks. Although no Army Service Academy was established for the Confederacy, some colleges such as the Citadel and Virginia Military Institute maintained cadet corps that trained Confederate military leadership. A naval academy was established at Drury's Bluff, Virginia in 1863, but no midshipmen graduated before the Confederacy's end. The soldiers of the Confederate Armed Forces consisted mainly of white males aged between 16 and 28. The median year of birth was 1838, so half the soldiers were 23 or older by 1861. In early 1862, the Confederate Army was allowed to disintegrate for two months following expiration of short-term enlistments. A majority of those in uniform would not re-enlist following their one-year commitment, so on April 16, 1862, the Confederate Congress enacted the first mass conscription on the North American continent. The U.S. Congress followed a year later on March 3, 1863, with the Enrollment Act, rather than a universal draft. The initial program was a selective service with physical, religious, professional and industrial exemptions. These were narrowed as the war progressed. Initially substitutes were permitted, but by December 1863 these were disallowed. In September 1862 the age limit was increased from 35 to 45 and by February 1864, all men under 18 and over 45 were conscripted to form a reserve for state defense inside state borders. By March 1864, the superintendent of conscription reported that all across the Confederacy, every officer in constituted authority, man and woman, "...engaged in opposing the enrolling officer in the execution of his duties." Although challenged in the state courts, the Confederate state Supreme Courts routinely rejected legal challenges to conscription. Many thousands of slaves served as laborers, cooks, and pioneers. Some freed blacks and men of color served in local state militia units of the Confederacy, primarily in Louisiana and South Carolina, but their officers deployed them for local defense, not combat. Depleted by casualties and desertions, the military suffered chronic manpower shortages. In early 1865, the Confederate Congress, influenced by the public support by General Lee, approved the recruitment of black infantry units. Contrary to Lee's and Davis's recommendations, the Congress refused to guarantee the freedom of black volunteers. No more than 200 black combat troops were ever raised. Topic. Raising troops the immediate onset of war meant that it was fought by the provisional or volunteer army. State governors resisted concentrating a national effort. Several wanted a strong state army for self-defense. Others feared large provisional armies answering only to Davis. When filling the Confederate government's call for 100,000 men, another 200,000 were turned away by accepting only those enlisted for the duration or 12-month volunteers who brought their own arms or horses, it was important to raise troops, it was just as important to provide capable officers to command them. With few exceptions the Confederacy secured excellent general officers. Efficiency in the lower officers was greater than could have been reasonably expected. As with the Federals, political appointees could be indifferent. Otherwise, the officer corps was governor appointed or elected by unit enlisted. Promotion to fill vacancies was made internally regardless of merit, even if better officers were immediately available, anticipating the need for more duration 
Men, in January 1862 Congress provided for company-level recruiters to return home for two months, but their efforts met little success on the heels of Confederate battlefield defeats in February. Congress allowed for Davis to require numbers of recruits from each governor to supply the volunteer shortfall. States responded by passing their own draft laws. The veteran Confederate Army of early 1862 was mostly 12 month volunteers with terms about to expire. Enlisted reorganization elections disintegrated the Army for two months. Officers pleaded with the ranks to re enlist, but a majority did not. Those remaining elected majors and colonels whose performance led to officer review boards in October. The boards caused a rapid and widespread thinning out of 1,700 incompetent officers. Troops thereafter would elect only second lieutenants. In early 1862, the popular press suggested the Confederacy required a million men under arms. But veteran soldiers were not re enlisting, and earlier secessionist volunteers did not reappear to serve in war. One Macon, Georgia, newspaper asked how two million brave fighting men of the South were about to be overcome by four million Northerners who were said to be cowards. Topic. Conscription The Confederacy passed the first American law of national conscription on April 16, 1862. The white males of the Confederate states from 18 to 35 were declared members of the Confederate Army for three years, and all men then enlisted were extended to a three-year term. They would serve only in units and under officers of their state. Those under 18 and over 35 could substitute for conscripts, in September those from 35 to 45 became conscripts. The cry of, rich man's war and a poor man's fight led Congress to abolish the substitute system altogether in December 1863. All principals benefiting earlier were made eligible for service. By February 1864, the age bracket was made 17 to 50, those under 18 and over 45 to be limited to in-state duty. Confederate conscription was not universal, it was a selective service. The first Conscription Act of April 1862 exempted occupations related to transportation, communication, industry, ministers, teaching and physical fitness. The second Conscription Act of October 1862 expanded exemptions in industry, agriculture and conscientious objection. Exemption fraud proliferated in medical examinations, army furloughs, churches, schools, apothecaries and newspapers. Rich men's sons were appointed to the socially outcast overseer occupation, but the measure was received in the country with universal odium. The legislative vehicle was the controversial 20 Negro law that specifically exempted one white overseer or owner for every plantation with at least 20 slaves. Backpedaling six months later, Congress provided overseers under 45 could be exempted only if they held the occupation before the first conscription act. The number of officials under state exemptions appointed by state governor patronage expanded significantly. By law, substitutes could not be subject to conscription, but instead of adding to Confederate manpower, unit officers in the field reported that over 50 and under 17-year-old substitutes made up to 90% of the desertions. The Conscription Act of February 1864 radically changed the whole system of selection. It abolished industrial exemptions, placing detail authority in President Davis. As the shame of conscription was greater than a felony conviction, the system brought in about as many volunteers as it did conscripts. Many men in otherwise bombproof positions were enlisted in one way or another, nearly 160,000 additional volunteers and conscripts in uniform. Still there was shirking. To administer the draft, a Bureau of Conscription was set up to use state officers, as state governors would allow. It had a checkered career of contention, opposition and futility. Armies appointed alternative military recruiters to bring in the out of uniform 17 to 50 year old conscripts and deserters. Nearly 3,000 officers were tasked with the job. By late 1864, Lee was calling for more troops. Our ranks are constantly diminishing by battle and disease, and few recruits are received, the consequences are inevitable." By March 1865 conscription was to be administered by generals of the state reserves calling out men over 45 and under 18 years old. All exemptions were abolished. These regiments were assigned to recruit conscripts ages 17 to 50, recover deserters, and repel enemy cavalry raids. 
The service retained men who had lost but one arm or a leg in home guards. April 1865 Lee surrendered an army of 50,000. Conscription had been a failure, the survival of the Confederacy depended on a strong base of civilians and soldiers devoted to victory. The soldiers performed well, though increasing numbers deserted in the last year of fighting, and the Confederacy never succeeded in replacing casualties as the Union could. The civilians, although enthusiastic in 1861–62, seemed to have lost faith in the future of the Confederacy by 1864, and instead looked to protect their homes and communities. As Rabel explains, "...this contraction of civic vision was more than a crabbed libertarianism, it represented an increasingly widespread disillusionment with the Confederate experiment." Topic. Victories, 1861. The American Civil War broke out in April 1861 with a Confederate victory at the Battle of Fort Sumter in Charleston. In January, President James Buchanan had attempted to resupply the garrison with the steamship, Star of the West, but Confederate artillery drove it away. In March, President Lincoln notified South Carolina Governor Pickens that without Confederate resistance to the resupply there would be no military reinforcement without further notice, but Lincoln prepared to force resupply if it were not allowed. Confederate President Davis, in cabinet, decided to seize Fort Sumter before the relief fleet arrived, and on April 12, 1861, General Beauregard forced its surrender. Following Sumter, Lincoln directed states to provide 75,000 troops for three months to recapture the Charleston Harbor forts and all other federal property. This emboldened secessionists in Virginia, Arkansas, Tennessee, and North Carolina to secede rather than provide troops to march into neighboring southern states. In May, federal troops crossed into Confederate territory along the entire border from the Chesapeake Bay to New Mexico. The first battles were Confederate victories at Big Bethel, Bethel Church, Virginia, First Bull Run, First Manassas in Virginia July and in August, Wilson's Creek, Oak Hills in Missouri. At all three, Confederate forces could not follow up their victory due to inadequate supply and shortages of fresh troops to exploit their successes. Following each battle, Federals maintained a military presence and occupied Washington, D.C., Fort Monroe, Virginia, and Springfield, Missouri. Both North and South began training up armies for major fighting the next year. Union General George B. McClellan's forces gained possession of much of northwestern Virginia in mid-1861, concentrating on towns and roads. The interior was too large to control and became the center of guerrilla activity. General Robert E. Lee was defeated at Cheat Mountain in September and no serious Confederate advance in western Virginia occurred until the next year. Meanwhile, the Union Navy seized control of much of the Confederate coastline from Virginia to South Carolina. It took over plantations and the abandoned slaves. Federals there began a war-long policy of burning grain supplies up rivers into the interior wherever they could not occupy. The Union Navy began a blockade of the major southern ports and prepared an invasion of Louisiana to capture New Orleans in early 1862. Topic: Incursions 1862. The victories of 1861 were followed by a series of defeats east and west in early 1862. To restore the Union by military force, the federal strategy was to 1. secure the Mississippi River, 2. seize or close Confederate ports, and 3. march on Richmond. To secure independence, the Confederate intent was to 1. repel the invader on all fronts, costing him blood and treasure, and 2. carry the war into the North by two offensives in time to affect the mid-term elections. Much of northwestern Virginia was under federal control. In February and March, most of Missouri and Kentucky were Union, occupied, consolidated, and used as staging areas for advances further south. Following the repulse of Confederate counterattack at the Battle of Shiloh, Tennessee, permanent Federal occupation expanded west, south and east. Confederate forces repositioned south along the Mississippi River to Memphis, Tennessee, where at the Naval Battle of Memphis, its river defense fleet was sunk. Confederates withdrew from northern Mississippi and northern Alabama. New Orleans was captured April 29 by a combined Army-Navy force under U.S. Admiral David Farragut, and the Confederacy lost control of the mouth of the Mississippi River. 
It had to concede extensive agricultural resources that had supported the Union Sea Supplied Logistics Base, although Confederates had suffered major reverses everywhere. As of the end of April, the Confederacy still controlled territory holding 72% of its population. Federal forces disrupted Missouri and Arkansas, they had broken through in western Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Louisiana. Along the Confederacy's shores, Union forces had closed ports and made garrisoned lodgments on every coastal Confederate state except Alabama and Texas. Although scholars sometimes assess the Union blockade as ineffectual under international law until the last few months of the war, from the first months it disrupted Confederate privateers, making it almost impossible to bring their prizes into Confederate ports. British firms developed small fleets of blockade running companies, such as John Fraser and Company, and the Ordnance Department secured its own blockade runners for dedicated munitions cargoes. During the Civil War fleets of armoured warships were deployed for the first time in sustained blockades at sea. After some success against the Union blockade, in March the ironclad CSS Virginia was forced into port and burned by Confederates at their retreat. Despite several attempts mounted from their port cities, CSA naval forces were unable to break the Union blockade. Attempts were made by Commodore Josiah Tatnall's ironclads from Savannah in 1862 with the CSS Atlanta. Secretary of the Navy Stephen Mallory placed his hopes in a European-built ironclad fleet, but they were never realized. On the other hand, four new English-built commerce raiders served the Confederacy, and several fast blockade runners were sold in Confederate ports. They were converted into commerce raiding cruisers, and manned by their British crews. In the east, Union forces could not close on Richmond. General McClellan landed his army on the lower peninsula of Virginia. Lee subsequently ended that threat from the east, then Union General John Pope attacked Overland from the north only to be repulsed at Second Bull Run Second Manassas. Lee's strike north was turned back at Antietam M.D., then Union Major General Ambrose Burnside's offensive was disastrously ended at Fredericksburg V.A. in December. Both armies then turned to winter quarters to recruit and train for the coming spring, in an attempt to seize the initiative, reprovision, protect farms in mid-growing season and influence U.S. congressional elections. Two major Confederate incursions into Union territory had been launched in August and September 1862. Both Braxton Bragg's invasion of Kentucky and Lee's invasion of Maryland were decisively repulsed, leaving Confederates in control of but 63% of its population. Civil War scholar Alan Nevins argues that 1862 was the strategic high-water mark of the Confederacy. The failures of the two invasions were attributed to the same irrecoverable shortcomings, lack of manpower at the front, lack of supplies including serviceable shoes, and exhaustion after long marches without adequate food. Also in September Confederate General William W. Loring pushed federal forces from Charleston, Virginia, and the Kanawha Valley in western Virginia, but lacking reinforcements Loring abandoned his position and by November the region was back in federal control. <laughs> Anaconda, 1863–64 The failed Middle Tennessee Campaign was ended January 2, 1863, at the inconclusive Battle of Stones River Murfreesboro, both sides losing the largest percentage of casualties suffered during the war. It was followed by another strategic withdrawal by Confederate forces. The Confederacy won a significant victory April 1863, repulsing the Federal advance on Richmond at Chancellorsville, but the Union consolidated positions along the Virginia coast and the Chesapeake Bay. Without an effective answer to federal gunboats, river transport and supply, the Confederacy lost the Mississippi River following the capture of Vicksburg, Mississippi, and Port Hudson in July, ending southern access to the Trans-Mississippi West. July brought short-lived counters, Morgan's raid into Ohio and the New York City draft riots. Robert E. Lee's strike into Pennsylvania was repulsed at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania despite Pickett's famous charge and other acts of valor. Southern newspapers assessed the campaign as, "...the Confederates did not gain a victory, neither did the enemy." September and November left Confederates yielding Chattanooga, Tennessee, the gateway to the Lower South. For the remainder of the war fighting was restricted inside the South, resulting in a slow but continuous loss of territory. In early 1864, the Confederacy still controlled 53% of its population, but it withdrew further to re-establish defensive positions. 
Union offensives continued with Sherman's march to the sea to take Savannah and Grant's wilderness campaign to encircle Richmond and besiege Lee's army at Petersburg. In April 1863, the C.S. Congress authorized a uniformed volunteer navy, many of whom were British. Wilmington and Charleston had more shipping while blockaded than before the beginning of hostilities. The Confederacy had altogether 18 commerce destroying cruisers, which seriously disrupted federal commerce at sea and increased shipping insurance rates 900%. Commodore Tatnall unsuccessfully attempted to break the Union blockade on the Savannah River in Georgia with an ironclad again in 1863. Beginning in April 1864 the ironclad CSS Albemarle engaged Union gunboats and sank or cleared them for six months on the Roanoke River North Carolina. The Federals closed Mobile Bay by sea-based amphibious assault in August, ending Gulf Coast trade east of the Mississippi River. In December, the Battle of Nashville ended Confederate operations in the Western Theater. Large numbers of families relocated to safer places, usually remote rural areas, bringing along household slaves if they had any. Mary Massey argues these elite exiles introduced an element of defeatism into the Southern outlook. Topic. Collapse, 1865 The first three months of 1865 saw the Federal Carolinas Campaign, devastating a wide swath of the remaining Confederate heartland. The breadbasket of the Confederacy in the Great Valley of Virginia was occupied by Philip Sheridan. The Union blockade captured Fort Fisher N.C., and Sherman finally took Charleston, South Carolina by land attack. The Confederacy controlled no ports, harbors or navigable rivers. Railroads were captured or had ceased operating. Its major food-producing regions had been war-ravaged or occupied. Its administration survived in only three pockets of territory holding one-third its population. Its armies were defeated or disbanding. At the February 1865 Hampton Roads Conference with Lincoln, senior Confederate officials rejected his invitation to restore the Union with compensation for emancipated slaves. The three pockets of unoccupied Confederacy were Southern Virginia North Carolina, Central Alabama Florida, and Texas, the latter two areas less from any notion of resistance than from the disinterest of federal forces to occupy them. The Davis policy was independence or nothing, while Lee's army was racked by disease and desertion, barely holding the trenches defending Jefferson Davis's capital. The Confederacy's last remaining blockade-running port, Wilmington, North Carolina, was lost. When the Union broke through Lee's lines at Petersburg, Richmond fell immediately. Lee surrendered the Army of Northern Virginia at Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia, on April 9, 1865. The surrender marked the end of the Confederacy. The CSS Stonewall sailed from Europe to break the Union blockade in March, on making Havana, Cuba it surrendered. Some high officials escaped to Europe, but President Davis was captured May 10, all remaining Confederate land forces surrendered by June 1865. The U.S. Army took control of the Confederate areas without post-surrender insurgency or guerrilla warfare against them, but peace was subsequently marred by a great deal of local violence, feuding and revenge killings. The last Confederate military unit, the Commerce Raider CSS Shenandoah, surrendered on November 6, 1865, in Liverpool. Historian Gary Gallagher concluded that the Confederacy capitulated in early 1865 because Northern armies crushed organized Southern military resistance. The Confederacy's population, soldier and civilian, had suffered material hardship and social disruption. They had expended and extracted a profusion of blood and treasure until collapse. The end had come. Jefferson Davis's assessment in 1890 determined, with the capture of the capital, the dispersion of the civil authorities, the surrender of the armies in the field, and the arrest of the president, the Confederate States of America disappeared. Their history henceforth became a part of the history of the United States. Topic: <laughs> Post-war history. Topic. Amnesty and treason issue When the war ended over 14,000 Confederates petitioned President Johnson for a pardon, he was generous in giving them out. He issued a general amnesty to all Confederate participants in the late Civil War in 1868. 
Congress passed additional Amnesty Acts in May 1866 with restrictions on office holding, and the Amnesty Act in May 1872 lifting those restrictions. There was a great deal of discussion in 1865 about bringing treason trials, especially against Jefferson Davis. There was no consensus in President Johnson's cabinet and there were no treason trials against anyone. In the case of Davis there was a strong possibility of acquittal which would have been humiliating for the government. Davis was indicted for treason but never tried. He was released from prison on bail in May 1867. The amnesty of December 25, 1868, by President Johnson eliminated any possibility of Jefferson Davis or anyone else associated with the Confederacy standing trial for treason. Henry Wirtz, the commandant of a notorious prisoner of war camp near Andersonville, Georgia, was tried and convicted by a military court, and executed on November 10, 1865. The charges against him involved conspiracy and cruelty, not treason. The U.S. government began a decade-long process known as Reconstruction which attempted to resolve the political and constitutional issues of the Civil War. The priorities were, to guarantee that Confederate nationalism and slavery were ended, to ratify and enforce the Thirteenth Amendment which outlawed slavery, the Fourteenth which guaranteed dual U.S. and state citizenship to all native-born residents, regardless of race, and the Fifteenth, which made it illegal to deny the right to vote because of race. By 1877, the Compromise of 1877 ended Reconstruction in the former Confederate states. Federal troops were withdrawn from the South, where conservative white Southern Democrats had already regained political control of state governments, often through extreme violence and fraud to suppress black voting. Confederate veterans had been temporarily disenfranchised by Reconstruction policy. The pre-war South had many rich areas, the war left the entire region economically devastated by military action, ruined infrastructure, and exhausted resources. Continuing to be dependent on an agricultural economy and resisting investment in infrastructure, the region remained dominated by the planter elite into the 20th century. After 1890 the Democratic-dominated legislatures worked to secure their control by passing new constitutions and amendments at the turn of the 20th century that disenfranchised most blacks and many poor whites. This exclusion of blacks from the political system, and great weakening of the Republican Party, was generally maintained until the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. The solid South of the early 20th century was built on white Democratic control of politics. The region did not achieve national levels of prosperity until long after World War II. Topic. Texas v. White In Texas v. White, 74 U.S. 700 1869, the United States Supreme Court ruled, by a 5-3 majority, that Texas had remained a state ever since it first joined the Union, despite claims that it joined the Confederate States of America. In this case, the court held that the Constitution did not permit a state to unilaterally secede from the United States. Further, that the ordinances of secession, and all the acts of the legislatures within seceding states intended to give effect to such ordinances, were absolutely null under the Constitution. This case settled the law that applied to all questions regarding state legislation during the war. Furthermore, it decided one of the central constitutional questions. Of the Civil War, the Union is perpetual and indestructible, as a matter of constitutional law. In declaring that no state could leave the Union, except through revolution or through consent of the states, it was explicitly repudiating the position of the Confederate states that the United States was a voluntary compact between sovereign states. Topic. Theories regarding the Confederacy's demise Topic. Died of states' rights Historian Frank Lawrence Ousley argued that the Confederacy died of states' rights. The central government was denied requisitioned soldiers and money by governors and state legislatures because they feared that Richmond would encroach on the rights of the states. Georgia's Governor Joseph Brown warned of a secret conspiracy by Jefferson Davis to destroy states' rights and individual liberty. The first conscription act in North America authorizing Davis to draft soldiers was said to be the essence of military despotism. Vice President Alexander H. Stevens feared losing the very form of Republican government. Allowing President Davis to threaten arbitrary arrests 
to draft hundreds of governor-appointed, bomb-proof bureaucrats conferred, more power than the English Parliament had ever bestowed on the king. History proved the dangers of such unchecked authority. The abolishment of draft exemptions for newspaper editors was interpreted as an attempt by the Confederate government to muzzle presses, such as the Raleigh North Carolina Standard, to control elections and to suppress the peace meetings there. As Rabel concludes, For Stevens, the essence of patriotism, the heart of the Confederate cause, rested on an unyielding commitment to traditional rights. Without considerations of military necessity, pragmatism, or compromise, in 1863 Governor Pendleton Mora of Texas determined that state troops were required for defense against Plains Indians and Union forces that might attack from Kansas. He refused to send his soldiers to the east. Governor Zebulon Vance of North Carolina showed intense opposition to conscription, limiting recruitment success. Vance's faith in states' rights drove him into repeated, stubborn opposition to the Davis administration. Despite political differences within the Confederacy, no national political parties were formed because they were seen as illegitimate. Anti partyism became an article of political faith. Without a two party system building alternative sets of national leaders, electoral protests tended to be narrowly state based, negative, carping, and petty. The 1863 mid-term elections became mere expressions of feudal and frustrated dissatisfaction. According to historian David M. Potter, this lack of a functioning two-party system caused real and direct damage to the Confederate war effort since it prevented the formulation of any effective alternatives to the conduct of the war by the Davis administration. Topic. Died of Davis The enemies of President Davis proposed that the Confederacy died of Davis. He was unfavorably compared to George Washington by critics such as Edward Alfred Pollard, editor of the most influential newspaper The Richmond Examiner. Coulter summarizes, The American Revolution had its Washington, the Southern Revolution had its Davis. One succeeded and the other failed. Beyond the early honeymoon period, Davis was never popular. He unwittingly caused much internal dissension from early on. His ill health and temporary bouts of blindness disabled him for days at a time. Coulter says Davis was heroic and his will was indomitable. But his tenacity, determination, and willpower stirred up lasting opposition of enemies Davis could not shake. He failed to overcome petty leaders of the states who made the term confederacy into a label for tyranny and oppression, denying the stars and bars, from becoming a symbol of larger patriotic service and sacrifice. Instead of campaigning to develop nationalism and gain support for his administration, he rarely courted public opinion, assuming an aloofness, almost like an Adams. Eskett argues that Davis was unable to mobilize Confederate nationalism in support of his government effectively, and especially failed to appeal to the small farmers who comprised the bulk of the population. In addition to the problems caused by states' rights, Eskett also emphasizes that the widespread opposition to any strong central government combined with the vast difference in wealth between the slave-owning class and the small farmers created insolvable dilemmas when the Confederate survival presupposed a strong central government backed by a united populace. The pre-war claim that white solidarity was necessary to provide a unified Southern voice in Washington no longer held. Davis failed to build a network of supporters who would speak up when he came under criticism, and he repeatedly alienated governors and other state based leaders by demanding centralized control of the war effort. Davis was not an efficient administrator. He attended to too many details. He protected his friends after their failures were obvious. He spent too much time on military affairs versus his civic responsibilities. Coulter concludes he was not the ideal leader for the Southern Revolution, but he showed fewer weaknesses than any other contemporary character available for the role. Robert E. Lee's assessment of Davis as president was, I knew of none that could have done as well. <laughs> <laughs> Government and politics Political divisions Constitution The Southern leaders met in Montgomery, Alabama, to write their constitution. 
Much of the Confederate States Constitution replicated the United States Constitution verbatim, but it contained several explicit protections of the institution of slavery including provisions for the recognition and protection of slavery in any territory of the Confederacy. It maintained the ban on international slave trading while protecting the existing internal trade of slaves among slaveholding states. In certain areas, the Confederate Constitution gave greater powers to the states or curtailed the powers of the central government more than the U.S. Constitution of the time did, but in other areas, the states lost rights they had under the U.S. Constitution. Although the Confederate Constitution, like the U.S. Constitution, contained a Commerce Clause, the Confederate version prohibited the central government from using revenues collected in one state for funding internal improvements in another state. The Confederate Constitution's equivalent to the U.S. Constitution's General Welfare Clause prohibited protective tariffs but allowed tariffs for providing domestic revenue, and spoke of carrying on the government of the Confederate states, rather than providing for the general welfare. State legislatures had the power to impeach officials of the Confederate government in some cases. On the other hand, the Confederate Constitution contained a necessary and proper clause and a supremacy clause that essentially duplicated the respective clauses of the U.S. Constitution. The Confederate Constitution also incorporated each of the Twelve Amendments to the U.S. Constitution that had been ratified up to that point. The Confederate Constitution did not specifically include a provision allowing states to secede. The preamble spoke of each state acting in its sovereign and independent character, but also of the formation of a permanent federal government. During the debates on drafting the Confederate Constitution, one proposal would have allowed states to secede from the Confederacy. The proposal was tabled with only the South Carolina delegates voting in favor of considering the motion. The Confederate Constitution also explicitly denied states the power to bar slaveholders from other parts of the Confederacy from bringing their slaves into any state of the Confederacy or to interfere with the property rights of slave owners traveling between different parts of the Confederacy. In contrast with the language of the United States Constitution, the Confederate Constitution overtly asked God's blessing. Invoking the favor and guidance of Almighty God. Topic. Executive The Montgomery Convention to establish the Confederacy and its executive met on February 4, 1861. Each state as a sovereignty had one vote, with the same delegation size as it held in the U.S. Congress, and generally 41 to 50 members attended. Offices were provisional, limited to a term not to exceed one year. One name was placed in nomination for president, one for vice president. Both were elected unanimously, 6-0. Jefferson Davis was elected provisional president. His U.S. Senate resignation speech greatly impressed with its clear rationale for secession and his pleading for a peaceful departure from the Union to independence. Although he had made it known that he wanted to be commander-in-chief of the Confederate armies, when elected, he assumed the office of provisional president. Three candidates for provisional vice president were under consideration the night before the February 9 election. All were from Georgia, and the various delegations meeting in different places determined two would not do, so Alexander H. Stevens was elected unanimously provisional vice president, though with some privately held reservations. Stevens was inaugurated February 11, Davis February 18, Davis and Stevens were elected president and vice president, unopposed on November 6, 1861. They were inaugurated on February 22, 1862. Historian E. M. Coulter observed, No president of the U.S. ever had a more difficult task. Washington was inaugurated in peacetime. Lincoln inherited an established government of long standing. The creation of the Confederacy was accomplished by men who saw themselves as fundamentally conservative. Although they referred to their revolution, it was in their eyes more a counter revolution against changes away from their understanding of U.S. founding documents. In Davis's inauguration speech, he explained the Confederacy was not a French-like revolution, but a transfer of rule. The Montgomery Convention had assumed all the laws of the United States until superseded by the Confederate Congress. The permanent Constitution provided for a President of the Confederate States of America, elected to serve a six-year term but without the possibility of re-election. Unlike the United States Constitution, the Confederate Constitution gave the president the ability to subject a bill to a line-item veto, a power also held by some state governors. 
The Confederate Congress could overturn either the general or the line item vetoes with the same two thirds votes required in the U.S. Congress. In addition, appropriations not specifically requested by the executive branch required passage by a two thirds vote in both houses of Congress. The only person to serve as president was Jefferson Davis, due to the Confederacy being defeated before the completion of his term. Topic. Administration and cabinet Topic. Legislative The only two formal, national, functioning, civilian administrative bodies in the Civil War South were the Jefferson Davis administration and the Confederate Congresses. The Confederacy was begun by the Provisional Congress in Convention at Montgomery, Alabama on February 28, 1861. It had one vote per state in a unicameral assembly. The Permanent Confederate Congress was elected and began its first session February 18, 1862. The Permanent Congress for the Confederacy followed the United States forms with a bicameral legislature. The Senate had two per state, 26 senators. The House numbered 106 representatives apportioned by free and slave populations within each state. Two Congresses sat in six sessions until March 18, 1865. The political influences of the civilian, soldier vote and appointed representatives reflected divisions of political geography of a diverse South. These in turn changed over time relative to Union occupation and disruption, the war impact on local economy, and the course of the war. Without political parties, key candidate identification related to adopting secession before or after Lincoln's call for volunteers to retake federal property. Previous party affiliation played a part in voter selection, predominantly secessionist Democrat or Unionist Whig. The absence of political parties made individual roll call voting all the more important, as the Confederate freedom of roll call voting was unprecedented in American legislative history. Key issues throughout the life of the Confederacy related to 1. suspension of habeas corpus, 2. military concerns such as control of state militia, conscription and exemption, 3. economic and fiscal policy including impressment of slaves, goods and scorched earth, and 4. support of the Jefferson Davis administration in its foreign affairs and negotiating peace. Topic. Judicial The Confederate Constitution outlined a judicial branch of the government, but the ongoing war and resistance from states' rights advocates, particularly on the question of whether it would have appellate jurisdiction over the state courts, prevented the creation or seating of the Supreme Court of the Confederate States. The state courts generally continued to operate as they had done, simply recognizing the Confederate states as the national government. Confederate district courts were authorized by Article 3, Section 1, of the Confederate Constitution, and President Davis appointed judges within the individual states of the Confederate States of America. In many cases, the same U.S. federal district judges were appointed as Confederate states district judges. Confederate district courts began reopening in early 1861, handling many of the same type cases as had been done before. Prize cases, in which Union ships were captured by the Confederate Navy or raiders and sold through court proceedings, were heard until the blockade of southern ports made this impossible. After a sequestration act was passed by the Confederate Congress, the Confederate district courts heard many cases in which enemy aliens typically northern absentee landlords owning property in the South had their property sequestered seized by Confederate receivers. When the matter came before the Confederate court, the property owner could not appear because he was unable to travel across the front lines between Union and Confederate forces. Thus, the district attorney won the case by default, the property was typically sold, and the money used to further the Southern War effort. Eventually, because there was no Confederate Supreme Court, sharp attorneys like South Carolina's Edward McCrady began filing appeals. This prevented their client's property from being sold until a Supreme Court could be constituted to hear the appeal, which never occurred. Where federal troops gained control over parts of the Confederacy and re-established civilian government, U.S. district courts sometimes resumed jurisdiction, Supreme Court, not established. District courts, judges Topic. Post office When the Confederacy was formed and its seceding states broke from the Union, it was at once confronted with the arduous task of providing its citizens with a mail delivery system, and, in the midst of the American Civil War, the newly formed Confederacy created and established the Confederate Post Office. 
One of the first undertakings in establishing the post office was the appointment of John H. Reagan to the position of Postmaster General, by Jefferson Davis in 1861, making him the first Postmaster General of the Confederate Post Office as well as a member of Davis's presidential cabinet. Through Reagan's resourcefulness and remarkable industry, he had his department assembled, organized and in operation before the other presidential cabinet members had their departments fully operational. When the war began, the U.S. Post Office still delivered mail from the secessionist states for a brief period of time. Mail that was postmarked after the date of a state's admission into the Confederacy through May 31, 1861, and bearing U.S. postage was still delivered. After this time, private express companies still managed to carry some of the mail across enemy lines. Later, mail that crossed lines had to be sent by flag of truce and was allowed to pass at only two specific points. Mail sent from the South to the North States was received, opened and inspected at Fortress Monroe on the Virginia coast before being passed on into the U.S. mail stream. Mail sent from the north to the south passed at City Point, also in Virginia, where it was also inspected before being sent on. With the chaos of the war, a working postal system was more important than ever for the Confederacy. The Civil War had divided family members and friends and consequently letter writing increased dramatically across the entire divided nation, especially to and from the men who were away serving in an army. Mail delivery was also important for the Confederacy for a myriad of business and military reasons. Because of the Union blockade, basic supplies were always in demand and so getting mailed correspondence out of the country to suppliers was imperative to the successful operation of the Confederacy. Volumes of material have been written about the blockade runners who evaded Union ships on blockade patrol, usually at night, and who moved cargo and mail in and out of the Confederate states throughout the course of the war. Of particular interest to students and historians of the American Civil War is prisoner of war mail and blockade mail as these items were often involved with a variety of military and other wartime activities. The postal history of the Confederacy along with surviving Confederate mail has helped historians document the various people, places and events that were involved in the American Civil War as it unfolded. Topic. Civil liberties. The Confederacy actively used the army to arrest people suspected of loyalty to the United States. Historian Mark Neely found 4,108 names of men arrested and estimated a much larger total. The Confederacy arrested pro-Union civilians in the South at about the same rate as the Union arrested pro-Confederate civilians in the North. Neely argues, the Confederate citizen was not any freer than the Union citizen, and perhaps no less likely to be arrested by military authorities. In fact, the Confederate citizen may have been in some ways less free than his northern counterpart. For example, freedom to travel within the Confederate states was severely limited by a domestic passport system. Topic. Economy Topic. Slaves. Across the South, widespread rumors alarmed the whites by predicting the slaves were planning some sort of insurrection. Patrols were stepped up. The slaves did become increasingly independent, and resistant to punishment, but historians agree there were no insurrections. In the invaded areas, insubordination was more the norm than loyalty to the old master, Bell Wiley says. It was not disloyalty, but the lure of freedom. Many slaves became spies for the North, and large numbers ran away to federal lines. Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, an executive order of the U.S. government on January 1, 1863, changed the legal status of three million slaves in designated areas of the Confederacy from slave to free. The long term effect was that the Confederacy could not preserve the institution of slavery, and lost the use of the core element of its plantation labor force. Slaves were legally freed by the proclamation, and became free by escaping to federal lines, or by advances of federal troops. Many freed slaves served as volunteers in the federal army as teamsters, cooks, laundresses and laborers, and eventually as soldiers. Plantation owners, realizing that emancipation would destroy their economic system, sometimes moved their slaves as far as possible out of reach of the Union Army. By Juneteenth. June 19, 1865, in Texas, the Union Army controlled all of the Confederacy and had liberated all its slaves. Their owners never received compensation. Topic. Political economy 
Most whites were subsistence farmers who traded their surpluses locally. The plantations of the South, with white ownership and an enslaved labor force, produced substantial wealth from cash crops. It supplied two-thirds of the world's cotton, which was in high demand for textiles, along with tobacco, sugar, and naval stores such as turpentine. These raw materials were exported to factories in Europe and the Northeast. Planters reinvested their profits in more slaves and fresh land, for cotton and tobacco depleted the soil. There was little manufacturing or mining, shipping was controlled by outsiders. The plantations that enslaved over three million black people were the principal source of wealth. Most were concentrated in black belt plantation areas because few white families in the poor regions owned slaves. For decades there had been widespread fear of slave revolts. During the war extra men were assigned to home guard, patrol duty and governors sought to keep militia units at home for protection. Historian William Barney reports, No major slave revolts erupted during the Civil War. Nevertheless, slaves took the opportunity to enlarge their sphere of independence, and when Union forces were nearby, many ran off to join them. Slave labor was applied in industry in a limited way in the Upper South and in a few port cities. One reason for the regional lag in industrial development was top-heavy income distribution. Mass production requires mass markets, and slaves living in small cabins, using self-made tools and outfitted with one suit of work clothes each year of inferior fabric, did not generate consumer demand to sustain local manufacturers of any description in the same way a mechanized family farm of free labor did in the North. The Southern economy was pre-capitalist. In that slaves were put to work in the largest revenue-producing enterprises, not free labor market. That labor system as practiced in the American South encompassed paternalism, whether abusive or indulgent, and that meant labor management considerations apart from productivity. Approximately 85% of both North and South white populations lived on family farms, both regions were predominantly agricultural, and mid-century industry in both was mostly domestic. But the southern economy was pre-capitalist in its overwhelming reliance on the agriculture of cash crops to produce wealth, while the great majority of farmers fed themselves and supplied a small local market. Southern cities and industries grew faster than ever before, but the thrust of the rest of the country's exponential growth elsewhere was toward urban industrial development along transportation systems of canals and railroads. The south was following the dominant currents of the American economic mainstream, but at a great distance. As it lagged in the all-weather modes of transportation that brought cheaper, speedier freight shipment and forged new, expanding into regional markets, a third count of southern pre-capitalist economy relates to the cultural setting. The South and Southerners did not adopt a work ethic, nor the habits of thrift that marked the rest of the country. It had access to the tools of capitalism, but it did not adopt its culture. The Southern cause as a national economy in the Confederacy was grounded in slavery and race, planters and patricians, plain folk and folk culture, cotton and plantations". Topic. National production The Confederacy started its existence as an agrarian economy with exports, to a world market, of cotton, and, to a lesser extent, tobacco and sugarcane. Local food production included grains, hogs, cattle, and gardens. The cash came from exports but the southern people spontaneously stopped exports in early 1861 to hasten the impact of King Cotton. When the blockade was announced, commercial shipping practically ended, the ships could not get insurance, and only a trickle of supplies came via blockade runners. The cutoff of exports was an economic disaster for the South, rendering useless its most valuable properties, its plantations and their enslaved workers. Many planters kept growing cotton, which piled up everywhere, but most turned to food production. All across the region, the lack of repair and maintenance wasted away the physical assets. The 11 states had produced $155 million in manufactured goods in 1860, chiefly from local grist mills, and lumber, processed tobacco, cotton goods and naval stores such as turpentine. The main industrial areas were border cities such as Baltimore, Wheeling, Louisville and St. Louis, that were never under Confederate control. The government did set up munitions factories in the Deep South. Combined with captured munitions and those coming via blockade runners, the armies were kept minimally supplied with weapons. The soldiers suffered from reduced rations, lack of medicines, and the growing shortages of uniforms, shoes and boots. 
Shortages were much worse for civilians, and the prices of necessities steadily rose. The Confederacy adopted a tariff or tax on imports of 15%, and imposed it on all imports from other countries, including the United States. The tariff mattered little, the Union blockade minimized commercial traffic through the Confederacy's ports, and very few people paid taxes on goods smuggled from the North. The Confederate government in its entire history collected only $3.5 million in tariff revenue. The lack of adequate financial resources led the Confederacy to finance the war through printing money, which led to high inflation. The Confederacy underwent an economic revolution by centralization and standardization, but it was too little too late as its economy was systematically strangled by blockade and raids. Topic: <laughs> Transportation systems. In peacetime, the South's extensive and connected systems of navigable rivers and coastal access allowed for cheap and easy transportation of agricultural products. The railroad system in the South had developed as a supplement to the navigable rivers to enhance the all-weather shipment of cash crops to market. Railroads tied plantation areas to the nearest river or seaport and so made supply more dependable, lowered costs and increased profits. In the event of invasion, the vast geography of the Confederacy made logistics difficult for the Union. Wherever Union armies invaded, they assigned many of their soldiers to garrison captured areas and to protect rail lines. At the onset of the Civil War the South had a rail network disjointed and plagued by changes in track gauge as well as lack of interchange. Locomotives and freight cars had fixed axles and could not use tracks of different gauges widths. Railroads of different gauges leading to the same city required all freight to be offloaded onto wagons for transport to the connecting railroad station, where it had to await freight cars and a locomotive before proceeding. Centers requiring offloading included Vicksburg, New Orleans, Montgomery, Wilmington and Richmond. In addition, most rail lines led from coastal or river ports to inland cities, with few lateral railroads. Due to this design limitation, the relatively primitive railroads of the Confederacy were unable to overcome the Union naval blockade of the South's crucial intra-coastal and river routes. The Confederacy had no plan to expand, protect or encourage its railroads. Southerners' refusal to export the cotton crop in 1861 left railroads bereft of their main source of income. Many lines had to lay off employees, many critical skilled technicians and engineers were permanently lost to military service. In the early years of the war the Confederate government had a hands-off approach to the railroads. Only in mid-1863 did the Confederate government initiate a national policy, and it was confined solely to aiding the war effort. Railroads came under the de facto control of the military. In contrast, the U.S. Congress had authorized military administration of Union-controlled railroad and telegraph systems in January 1862, imposed a standard gauge, and built railroads into the South using that gauge. Confederate armies successfully reoccupying territory could not be resupplied directly by rail as they advanced. The C.S. Congress formally authorized military administration of railroads in February 1865. In the last year before the end of the war, the Confederate railroad system stood permanently on the verge of collapse. There was no new equipment and raids on both sides systematically destroyed key bridges, as well as locomotives and freight cars. Spare parts were cannibalized, feeder lines were torn up to get replacement rails for trunk lines, and rolling stock wore out through heavy use. Topic. Horses and mules The Confederate Army experienced a persistent shortage of horses and mules, and requisitioned them with dubious promissory notes given to local farmers and breeders. Union forces paid in real money and found ready sellers in the South. Both armies needed horses for cavalry and for artillery. Mules pulled the wagons. The supply was undermined by an unprecedented epidemic of glanders, a fatal disease that baffled veterinarians. After 1863 the invading Union forces had a policy of shooting all the local horses and mules they did not need, in order to keep them out of Confederate hands. The Confederate armies and farmers experienced a growing shortage of horses and mules, which hurt the Southern economy and the war effort. The South lost half of its 2.5 million horses and mules, many farmers ended the war with none left. Army horses were used up by hard work, malnourishment, disease and battle wounds, they had a life expectancy of about seven months. 
Financial instruments Both the individual Confederate states and later the Confederate government printed Confederate States of America dollars as paper currency in various denominations, with a total face value of $1.5 billion. Much of it was signed by Treasurer Edward C. Elmore. Inflation became rampant as the paper money depreciated and eventually became worthless. The state governments and some localities printed their own paper money, adding to the runaway inflation. Many bills still exist, although in recent years counterfeit copies have proliferated. The Confederate government initially wanted to finance its war mostly through tariffs on imports, export taxes, and voluntary donations of gold. After the spontaneous imposition of an embargo on cotton sales to Europe in 1861, these sources of revenue dried up and the Confederacy increasingly turned to issuing debt and printing money to pay for war expenses. The Confederate States politicians were worried about angering the general population with hard taxes. A tax increase might disillusion many Southerners, so the Confederacy resorted to printing more money. As a result, inflation increased and remained a problem for the Southern states throughout the rest of the war. By April 1863, for example, the cost of flour in Richmond had risen to $100 a barrel and housewives were rioting. The Confederate government took over the three national mints, the Charlotte Mint in North Carolina, the Dahlonega Mint in Georgia, and the New Orleans Mint in Louisiana. During 1861, the first two produced small amounts of gold coinage, the latter half dollars. Since the mints used the current dyes on hand, these issues remain indistinguishable from those minted by the Union. In New Orleans the Confederacy used its own reverse design to strike four half dollars. U.S. coinage was hoarded and did not have any general circulation. U.S. coinage was admitted as legal tender up to ten dollars, as were British sovereigns, French Napoleons and Spanish and Mexican doubloons at a fixed rate of exchange. Confederate money was paper and postage stamps. Topic. Food shortages and riots By mid-1861, the Union naval blockade virtually shut down the export of cotton and the import of manufactured goods. Food that formerly came overland was cut off. Women had charge of making do. They cut back on purchases, brought out old spinning wheels and enlarged their gardens with flax and peas to provide clothing and food. They used ersatz substitutes when possible, but there was no real coffee and it was hard to develop a taste for the okra or chicory substitutes used. The households were severely hurt by inflation in the cost of everyday items like flour and the shortages of food, fodder for the animals, and medical supplies for the wounded. State governments pleaded with planters to grow less cotton and more food. Most refused. When cotton prices soared in Europe, expectations were that Europe would soon intervene to break the blockade and make them rich. The myth of omnipotent, King Cotton, died hard. The Georgia legislature imposed cotton quotas, making it a crime to grow in excess. But food shortages only worsened, especially in the towns. The overall decline in food supplies, made worse by the inadequate transportation system, led to serious shortages and high prices in urban areas. When bacon reached a dollar a pound in 1863, the poor women of Richmond, Atlanta, and many other cities began to riot. They broke into shops and warehouses to seize food. The women expressed their anger at ineffective state relief efforts, speculators, and merchants. As wives and widows of soldiers they were hurt by the inadequate welfare system. Topic. Devastation by 1865 By the end of the war deterioration of the southern infrastructure was widespread. The number of civilian deaths is unknown. Every Confederate state was affected, but most of the war was fought in Virginia and Tennessee, while Texas and Florida saw the least military action. Much of the damage was caused by direct military action, but most was caused by lack of repairs and upkeep, and by deliberately using up resources. Historians have recently estimated how much of the devastation was caused by military action. Paul Paskoff calculates that Union military operations were conducted in 56% of 645 counties in nine Confederate states excluding Texas and Florida. These counties contained 63% of the 1860 white population and 64% of the slaves. By the time the fighting took place, undoubtedly some people had fled to safer areas, so the exact population exposed to war is unknown.
The eleven Confederate states in the 1860 United States Census had 297 towns and cities with 835,000 people, of these 162 with 681,000 people were at one point occupied by Union forces. Eleven were destroyed or severely damaged by war action, including Atlanta with an 1860 population of 9,600, Charleston, Columbia, and Richmond with pre-war populations of 40,500, 8,100, and 37,900, respectively. The eleven contained 115,900 people in the 1860 census, or 14% of the urban South. Historians have not estimated what their actual population was when Union forces arrived. The number of people as of 1860 who lived in the destroyed towns represented just over 1% of the Confederacy's 1860 population. In addition, 45 courthouses were burned out of 830. The South's agriculture was not highly mechanized. The value of farm implements and machinery in the 1860 census was $81 million. By 1870, there was 40% less, worth just $48 million. Many old tools had broken through heavy use, new tools were rarely available, even repairs were difficult, the economic losses affected everyone. Banks and insurance companies were mostly bankrupt. Confederate currency and bonds were worthless. The billions of dollars invested in slaves vanished. Most debts were also left behind. Most farms were intact but most had lost their horses, mules and cattle, fences and barns were in disrepair. Paskoff shows the loss of farm infrastructure was about the same whether or not fighting took place nearby. The loss of infrastructure and productive capacity meant that rural widows throughout the region faced not only the absence of able-bodied men, but a depleted stock of material resources that they could manage and operate themselves. During four years of warfare, disruption, and blockades, the South used up about half its capital stock. The North, by contrast, absorbed its material losses so effortlessly that it appeared richer at the end of the war than at the beginning. The rebuilding took years and was hindered by the low price of cotton after the war. Outside investment was essential, especially in railroads. One historian has summarized the collapse of the transportation infrastructure needed for economic recovery. One of the greatest calamities which confronted Southerners was the havoc wrought on the transportation system. Roads were impassable or non-existent, and bridges were destroyed or washed away. The important river traffic was at a standstill, levees were broken, channels were blocked, the few steamboats which had not been captured or destroyed were in a state of disrepair, wharves had decayed or were missing, and trained personnel were dead or dispersed. Horses, mules, oxen, carriages, wagons, and carts had nearly all fallen prey at one time or another to the contending armies. The railroads were paralyzed, with most of the companies bankrupt. These lines had been the special target of the enemy. On one stretch of 114 miles in Alabama, every bridge and trestle was destroyed, cross ties rotten, buildings burned, water tanks gone, ditches filled up, and tracks grown up in weeds and bushes. Communication centers like Columbia and Atlanta were in ruins, shops and foundries were wrecked or in disrepair. Even those areas bypassed by battle had been pirated for equipment needed on the battlefront, and the wear and tear of wartime usage without adequate repairs or replacements reduced all to a state of disintegration. Topic. Effect on women and families About 250,000 men never came home, some 30% of all white men aged 18 to 40, in 1860. Widows who were overwhelmed often abandoned the farm and merged into the households of relatives, or even became refugees living in camps with high rates of disease and death. In the Old South, being an old maid was something of an embarrassment to the woman and her family. After the war it became almost a norm. Some women welcomed the freedom of not having to marry. Divorce, while never fully accepted, became more common. The concept of the new woman emerged, she was self-sufficient and independent, and stood in sharp contrast to the Southern Belle of antebellum lore. Topic. National flags Flags of the Confederate States of America The first official flag of the Confederate States of America, called the Stars and Bars, originally had seven stars, representing the first seven states that initially formed the Confederacy. 
As more states joined, more stars were added, until the total was 13 two stars were added for the divided states of Kentucky and Missouri. During the First Battle of Bull Run, First Manassas, it sometimes proved difficult to distinguish the stars and bars from the Union flag. To rectify the situation, a separate battle flag was designed for use by troops in the field. Also known as the Southern Cross, many variations sprang from the original square configuration. Although it was never officially adopted by the Confederate government, the popularity of the Southern Cross among both soldiers and the civilian population was a primary reason why it was made the main color feature when a new national flag was adopted in 1863. This new standard, known as the Stainless Banner, consisted of a lengthened white field area with a battle flag canton. This flag too had its problems when used in military operations as, on a windless day, it could easily be mistaken for a flag of truce or surrender. Thus, in 1865, a modified version of the stainless banner was adopted. This final national flag of the Confederacy kept the battle flag canton, but shortened the white field and added a vertical red bar to the fly end. Because of its depiction in the 20th century and popular media, many people consider the rectangular battle flag with the dark blue bars as being synonymous with the Confederate flag, but this flag was never adopted as a Confederate national flag. The Confederate flag has a color scheme similar to the official battle flag, but is rectangular, not square. Its design and shape matches the naval jack, but the blue bars are darker. The Confederate flag is a highly recognizable symbol of the South in the United States today, and continues to be a controversial icon. Geography Region and climate The Confederate States of America claimed a total of 2,919 miles 4,698 kilometers of coastline, thus a large part of its territory lay on the seacoast with level and often sandy or marshy ground. Most of the interior portion consisted of arable farmland, though much was also hilly and mountainous, and the far western territories were deserts. The lower reaches of the Mississippi River bisected the country, with the western half often referred to as the Trans-Mississippi. The highest point excluding Arizona and New Mexico was Guadalupe Peak in Texas at 8,750 feet 2,670 meters. Climate Much of the area claimed by the Confederate States of America had a humid subtropical climate with mild winters and long, hot, humid summers. The climate and terrain varied from vast swamps such as those in Florida and Louisiana to semi-arid steppes and arid deserts west of longitude 100 degrees west. The subtropical climate made winters mild but allowed infectious diseases to flourish. Consequently, on both sides more soldiers died from disease than were killed in combat, a fact hardly atypical of pre-World War I conflicts. Demographics Population The United States Census of 1860 gives a picture of the overall 1860 population of the areas that joined the Confederacy. Note that population numbers exclude non-assimilated Indian tribes. Figures for Virginia include the future West Virginia. Rows may not total to 100% due to rounding. In 1860 the areas that later formed the 11 Confederate states and including the future West Virginia had 132,760 1.46% free blacks. Males made up 49.2% of the total population and females 50.8% whites, 48.60% male, 51.40% female, slaves, 50.15% male, 49.85% female, free blacks, 47.43% male, 52.57% female. Topic. Rural and urban population The CSA was overwhelmingly rural land. Few towns had populations of more than 1,000 the typical county seat had a population of fewer than 500 people. Cities were rare. Of the 20 largest U.S. cities in the 1860 census, only New Orleans lay in Confederate territory, and the Union captured New Orleans in 1862. 
Only 13 Confederate controlled cities ranked among the top 100 U.S. cities in 1860, most of them ports whose economic activities vanished or suffered severely in the Union blockade. The population of Richmond swelled after it became the Confederate capital, reaching an estimated 128,000 in 1864. Other southern cities in the border slave holding states such as Baltimore, Washington, D.C., Wheeling, w. VA, formerly VA, Alexandria, Louisville, and St. Louis never came under the control of the Confederate government. The cities of the Confederacy included most prominently in order of size of population. See also Atlanta in the Civil War, Charleston, South Carolina, in the Civil War, Nashville in the Civil War, New Orleans in the Civil War, Wilmington, North Carolina, in the American Civil War, and Richmond in the Civil War. Topic. Religion The CSA was overwhelmingly Protestant. Both free and enslaved populations identified with evangelical Protestantism. Baptists and Methodists together formed majorities of both the white and the slave population see Black Church. Freedom of religion and separation of church and state were fully ensured by Confederate laws. Church attendance was very high and chaplains played a major role in the army. Most large denominations experienced a north-south split in the pre-war era on the issue of slavery. The creation of a new country necessitated independent structures. For example, the Presbyterian Church in the United States split, with much of the new leadership provided by Joseph Ruggles Wilson father of President Woodrow Wilson. In 1861, he organized the meeting that formed General Assembly of the Southern Presbyterian Church and served as its chief executive for 37 years. Baptists and Methodists both broke off from their northern coreligionists over the slavery issue, forming the Southern Baptist Convention and the Methodist Episcopal Church, South, respectively. Elites in the Southeast favored the Protestant Episcopal Church in the Confederate States of America, which reluctantly split off the Episcopal Church USA in 1861. Other elites were Presbyterians belonging to the 1861-founded Presbyterian Church in the United States. Catholics included an Irish working-class element in coastal cities and an old French element in southern Louisiana. Other insignificant and scattered religious populations included Lutherans, the Holiness Movement, other Reformed, other Christian fundamentalists, the Stone Campbell Restoration Movement, the Churches of Christ, the Latter-day Saints Movement, Adventists, Muslims, Jews, Native American animists, Deists and irreligious people. The Southern Churches met the shortage of army chaplains by sending missionaries. The Southern Baptists started in 1862 and had a total of 78 missionaries. Presbyterians were even more active with 112 missionaries in January 1865. Other missionaries were funded and supported by the Episcopalians, Methodists, and Lutherans. One result was wave after wave of revivals in the army. <laughs> <laughs> Military leaders Military leaders of the Confederacy with their state or country of birth and highest rank included Topic. See also History of the Southern United States Congress of the Confederate States of America President of the Confederate States of America Cabinet of the Confederate States of America Confederate War Finance Confederate States Army Confederate Patent Office Confederate Postage Stamps and Postal History Confederate seal Confederate flag List of treaties of the Confederate States of America Prisoner of war camps List of Confederate arms manufacturers List of Confederate arsenals and armories Confederatus Confederate colonies Golden Circle proposed country CSA the Confederate States of America 2004 Film Commemoration of the American Civil War Commemoration of the American Civil War on Postage Stamps List of Confederate Monuments National Civil War Naval Museum Topic Notes Topic References Topic Further reading Topic Overviews and reference Topic Historiography Topic State Studies Topic Social History, Blacks, Women Topic Intellectual History Topic Political History Topic Foreign Affairs Topic Economic History Topic Primary Sources Topic External links Confederate Offices Index of Politicians by Office Held or Sought Civil War Research and Discussion Group Asterisk Confederate States of AM. 
Army and Navy uniforms, 1861 The Countryman, 1862–1866, published weekly by Turnwald, Ga, edited by J.A. Turner The Federal and the Confederate Constitution compared Confederate currency at the Wayback Machine archived July 19, 2011, Confederate postage stamps photographs of the original Confederate Constitution and other Civil War documents owned by the Hargret Rare Book and Manuscript Library at the University of Georgia Libraries. Photographic History of the Civil War, 10 vols, 1912. Doc South, documenting the American South, numerous online text, image, and audio collections. The Boston Athenaeum has over 4,000 Confederate imprints, including rare books, pamphlets, government documents, manuscripts, serials, broadsides, maps, and sheet music that have been conserved and digitized. Oklahoma Digital Maps – Digital Collections of Oklahoma and Indian Territory Confederate States of America Collection at the Library of Congress Works by or about Confederate States of America at Internet Archive Works by Confederate States of America at LibriVox Public Domain Audiobooks Works by Confederate States of America at LibriVox Public Domain Audiobooks <laughs>